Um, so yeah, we're starting on a new topic for thermochemistry. So this, I sent you all an email and I reposted the syllabus after they canceled um, school for a whole week. Uh, so I basically flipped what would have been next Tuesday's class with today. Uh, so today I am covering the first half of thermochemistry. Um, and on Tuesday is your celebration. And uh, the good news about thermochemistry, what we're doing today, it pretty much all comes down to this formula. And so I'm going to do a quick intro of what the what these pieces mean. Um, as somebody sent me an email today and said they're really excited because there's really not a lot of factor label. It's it's going to be algebra, which is just punching numbers into this formula. Um, and then the other thing that I will talk about is you guys are doing class presentations again. Um, and so hopefully, well, you'll all be sending me an email sometime over the next week as you start researching and finding something. Um, and so thermochemistry is the study of heat that all chemical reactions involve some kind of, so therm we usually think of as heat. Um, this past week, as a lot of people lost power, um, I'm sure that became really important. Um, yeah, so it's a study, specifically thermochemistry is a study of heat change in a chemical reaction, right? Uh, we're going to first today look at specific heat. Uh, when a, a lot of you, if not most of you, are going to be taking physics at some point. And when you take physics, you also will do thermodynamics. They'll call it thermodynamics. And a lot of this is similar. The perspective is just different. And so um, in physics, you actually spend a lot of time talking about energy. Uh, and energy, there's two components to energy in classical physics. Uh, which is work and heat. And so the whole first term of physics, pretty much anywhere you take it, is all Newtonian physics and, um, and, and working with stuff. But usually, I know here at Mount Hood, it's second term that he gets into this stuff. But work is just force times distance. And you do, you do things like crashing cars into each other or trying to move things. Um, chemical reactions obviously can do work. We're going to be focusing, though, on heat. Um, and heat, that is the definition if you look it up and stuff. Heat is a transfer of thermal energy between two objects, two substances, two systems, um, with different Ke is kinetic energy. And kinetic energy, um, in one word, is movement, is how most people classically talk about it. So things that are moving, in terms of chemistry, we're talking about atoms, molecules, and so I always talk about it as jiggles and giggles. So uh, for those of you who had me for Chem 151, the jiggles and giggles are coming back. Um, they're in the last lab. But uh, so it's how much movement there is. Gases obviously have a much more movement as you heat things up, um, and we'll talk about that. So heat has to do with a transfer or the movement of heat from one object to another. Um, the key potential energy is stored energy. Uh, and we're not gonna be looking at that here, but all molecules, that's what bonds are. Chemical bonds are storing energy. And so Chem 222, the first two weeks, we actually look at this and we look at different ways that they do for um, calculating it. An example in all of our bodies for anybody who is bio, who's taken biology is ATP um, or is really into working out in the gym. And, and so ATP is um, adenosine triphosphate and bonds between phosphates, PO4s, um, actually store just the right amount of energy. And so our body, the energy that we have as we're moving around and stuff, um, or just breathing comes from um, those phosphates, the PO4 is hooked up together. Um, the other thing I should mention, because it drives me crazy, uh, in our body, they're always ionized. We'll get to that more next term. But uh, the other key thing is the units. 
And if you're having, I always joke, if you're having trouble falling asleep, uh, there is, I'm pretty sure I posted a free textbook. You can always read this chapter. I've never made it in any textbook through this chapter. It's usually like half of the book is this one chapter. Um, and they get into lots of detail. But And so for me, it's like if I had trouble falling asleep. The units um, in... metric in the metric system it is calories we are not going to be using calories but like food calories that is how much heat is in the food that we're eating and our food calories because we're actually big huge beings we're kilograms in sizes it's actually kilocalories we're going to be using joules which is a capital j and it doesn't have that line there so um and usually kilojoules so it is the system international, the SI unit, and in physics and chemistry and science um, and engineering, we usually work with joules. Uh, and it has to do with joules. Um, it's actually a better measurement because of how it's done. Calories is useful because the calories, because it's metric, metric is very much based off of water and it comes from specific heat. Um, and so what specific heat is, we're going to actually, this first page is about specific heat, and then we'll talk more about heat. Um, specific heat is, uh, it's, it's really, it is this unit, C is specific heat, or that's the symbol for it. It's actually called specific heat capacity. And so that's why they give it the symbol C. It is always a capital C. Um, and specific heat is the amount of heat to increase or to change the temperature um, of one gram of whatever the substance is by one degree Celsius. So it's a really tedious definition. You're never going to have to use this definition, but it explains the unit. So the units for C are going to be joules per gram degree Celsius. So it's how much heat for one gram to change by one degree Celsius. So a gram of water is pretty much a drop of water. So if you had a drop of water, a gram of water, so a teaspoon of water is 18 grams. So you can think about that. So it's about a drop of water. Um, you would have... Yeah, and a milliliter is 20 drops. I guess it'd be maybe a couple drops of water. To change it by one degree Celsius, it would be one joule. Or in, in the case of water, um, we're going to be using joules. If we're talking about H2O, if it's anything other than H2O, I will give you what it is, like I did right here. Um, but this is actually one of the keys about specific heat has to do with water. For water, it is one calorie per gram degree Celsius. That is the specific heat of water. Um, now, I mentioned we're not going to be using calories. So this is like the only time I use calories. Does anybody know what the number is uh, in joules? Perhaps it would be somebody who's taken physics. And actually, I have to warn, because I know like Omar and some other people are in physics, and most of you will be taking physics. The number is almost the same in chemistry. Um, Dave Faust, Dr. Mike Russell, and myself have had several conversations about this, um, and nobody knows why. We use the number four point, I, I have a theory why, but uh, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. This number is the specific heat of water. Um, and that you do need to know or have somewhere, we're gonna use it enough. Anything else, I will give you the specific heat. So the specific heat of aluminum is this, uh, 0.9, and that's actually a large number. Um, most of them are really small. Um, like for lead, it's like 0 0.1. Almost everything, it's less than one. And then there's water, that's like four. It's huge. And, and that is because water holds heat. Um, how I think of what specific heat is, it's really the capacity to hold heat. This is like a Sherpa definition. 
you're not going to find this on Google. <laughs> but um, if you go to the desert in Egypt, um, so it's just perfect. We have major in the class, right? Uh, and during the daytime, it will be 110 degrees. And then you can freeze to death at night because there's no water vapor. So there's nothing holding on to the heat. Whereas if you go to the coast like Astoria, it will be 60 degrees all day, all night, all year round because there's this big body of water. There's so much water vapor that the temperature pretty much is the same day and night and winter and summer. Um, our temperature here doesn't, I know you guys might believe it fluctuates, but it doesn't fluctuate like it does. Um, if you go to Utah in this in the daytime, it will be 105 degrees in the summer. And then at night, it's like this really comfortable uh, 70 degrees. The other thing about this huge number is it means if uh, water holds on to the heat really well, uh, if, if somebody dumped like a cup of boiling water, and those of you who work in coffee shops uh, would know this, Hot water, if you dump a lot of it on you, you can get serious burns. Um, if it's just like a, a drop of hot water, you'll go, ooh, and you'll fill it, but it's only a drop. And so if you only have a gram of it, that gram, even though no matter how much water, it's always the specific heat, uh, this Q means how much heat you have. So that is the symbol for heat versus specific heat. Specific heat is a constant. It's different for every substance. Um, and it depends on the cons it depends on the substance. Heat is a measurement that we're going to be calculating. And heat again is going to be in joules or kilojoules. So that is heat. Again, heat is the flow of energy. Um, between two things that have different temperatures, kinetic energy. Uh, specific heat is specific for each compound, and that is what it is for water. And that's what this first page is about. Uh, mass, of course, is going to be in grams, typically. And the other thing that is key is this, the triangle T. That's how most students say it the first day. Um, and if you go back and listen to the video, I did not say triangle T when I first said it. It is read as delta T. So that is the symbol. The triangle is a symbol in Greek um, for delta. And so it means change in temperature. It is, we actually, in these problems, we do not care about the temperature. We care about the difference in temperature. How much does the temperature change? Um, and so you'll see that as we solve the problems. And um, yeah, so I had the experience once. My mom, when I was a little girl, came, ran down the stairs at grandma's around the corner into the big farm kitchen as my mom was walking through the door with this huge, like, tent, huge, huge pot of really hot soup. And of course, it got dumped on me. My brother and sister thought it was hysterical as I stood there screaming because um, that amount of hot water, you're going to get burned. Um, but obviously, I lived to tell the story. We're so wonderful as children to our siblings, aren't we? Uh, all right, let's go ahead and just solve the problem. And it is a formula, so we're always going to state the formula we're using first. You're always going to state the formula. So you're not using factor label. You're going to state the formula. Now, you, I have seen the Q, that is a Q, written as a capital Q and as a lowercase Q. I don't care. Um, you're probably going to see me do a capital Q because I had a class 10 years ago. And they're all snickering right now. And, and they were very unkind to me. And they made fun of my lowercase Qs when I write them. And so um, we were actually, it was a most wonderful class. We were very close. And so they apparently thought it was OK. Uh, you can write the word mass, or you can just write M for mass. Well, actually, we should write mass, because somebody will think I wrote meters. Uh, change in temperature and C. So. This is how I learned the formula. This is how all books show it. Uh, for those of you who like to go to the tutors, the tutors, and I think it's Khan Academy does it, they write it as MCAT. 
So they write M C Delta T. Um, I think that's very centric on people who are going into medicine. And so I always write it in this order. It's algebra. It doesn't matter which piece comes first. Um, all right, let's go ahead and look at the problem. So it says we're going to calculate uh, the mass of the aluminum. So that is the piece that we're trying to find. This is our question mark in this question. And it then tells us it absorbs 24.1 kilojoules. So that's our Q. Um, so here's the question for you. How do I know that is the Q? Well, it tells me it's 24.1 kilojoules of heat. Um, but how do I know that's not C? I mean, C just is looking constant. At, well, C is a constant. And then the other thing, yeah, C is given here. It is the specific heat. So usually I write it like that, C of aluminum, but sometimes I write the word specific heat. Um, and again, when, he, when Damon said constant, it's a different constant for every substance. So for water, again, that's the only one I don't give you. I gave it to you right there. Um, this is the specific heat. And what I was driving at is, what do you notice that's different about the two? I mean, besides the number, the key, the key to this, to getting algebra and doing it great is going to be the unit. And heat, again, is just going to be joules or kilojoules. Specific heat is these funky units, joules per gram K. Oh, this is that problem I wanted to change. All right, I'm going to write mass is my unknown. You can write it now as M or write mass. And the other number we have to plug in here is the change in temperature. Um, and so usually it's going to give you two temperatures. Like in the next one, you can see we have different temperatures given, so you will calculate it. But on this one, it clearly states the temperature change is 107 degrees. So we can just write it in there. Um, and, and I'm moaning because this is where some students get tripped up. Um, and so I guess if you're not here, I won't know if you get tripped up. Um, so we're doing change in temperature. Say me know what the capital K stands for. Kelvin. It is. It's Kelvin. Um, so Celsius is a metric unit, and it was figured out by Sir, some dude named Celsius. I forget his first name. He was from France, and it's based off of water. The freezing point of water is zero Celsius, and the boiling point of water is 100. So everything in metric is multiples of 10. Um, and, and so that's why a calorie was defined as that. And the system international unit, which is used by chemists and physicists, was developed by Sir Kelvin in England across the channel from France. Um, and it has to do with absolute zero. When we do gas laws, we're going to talk about it in 222. Um, and here, the difference between Celsius and Kelvin, I'm going to write it up here, and then I, I was hoping to find everywhere I wrote the Kelvin to get rid of it. Um, degrees Celsius plus roughly 273 will give you Kelvin. And so zero Kelvin, Sir Kelvin said, okay, we have this point that every all movement all kinetic energy there's no more jiggles and giggles so if you have a perfect crystal at zero kelvin there's no movement absolutely no movement it's a theoretical number it's never been reached when you get below one kelvin really cool stuff happens to atoms um that was a gentleman who from uh india one of the most famous scientists uh and einstein so he was around the same time as Einstein, and Einstein had the highest respect for him. Um, but we don't seem to know much about him in our culture here. Uh, but there they have universities and stuff. He actually created a university, um, and he studied a lot of things other than just the plain physics and the math that we do. It's actually much more interesting. The change in temperature because we are not doing temperature, we're doing change in temperature. It is the same in degrees Celsius and Kelvin. Because the scales are just shifted by 273, when you do a change in temperature, 
there's always a student or two that don't believe me, you can change your temperature uh, to Kelvin. You're going to get the same thing. But in this case, it's a temperature change. So you can either just trust me on this one. Um, to, you can't change a temperature change by adding 273. You can change a temperature. There is a difference. And we can have a long discussion in an office hour, perhaps. But um, all right, you would just plug in and solve. There's going to be a problem we run into. And that is our units. For our units to cancel, that's why I had to change my temperature so that these were the same. So they're either both Kelvin or both Celsius. And again, change in temperature in Celsius and Kelvin is the same. Uh, when I rearrange the joules, right, I'm going to divide both sides. Sorry, we'll do it in a darker pen. Um, you would divide by the 107 Kelvin and the 0 0.901. Uh, joules per gram uh, Kelvin. So the Kelvin cancels itself. It's not a big deal. Here, the joule only cancels the J, and you are left still with the K. If you punch this in, you will get 0 0.25, and your unit would be kilogram. This gram is in the denominator of a denominator, so it's the double inverse thing that it flips to the top, and the kilo is still there. So that would get you kilograms. If you see that and you like that trick, that's great. Otherwise, you would have to do an extra step and you would just do that there's 10 to the third joules per one kilojoule. It's the same thing. And you would get my answer of 250 grams. Um, I don't know, it must round so it comes out like that. And so it must have three sig figs. A zero with no decimal is vague. Um, so we'll add a zero here. I didn't specify the units, so this answer is perfectly fine. It's all with the units. So I know some of you are like, oh, I'm so glad we're not doing factory label anymore. That's wonderful. We're doing algebra. It's all about the units. It's always all about the units. When you take physics and you're working with 10 units at a time, go back to the units to see how they cancel out. Metric is this amazing thing. That K is still there. You can solve in kilograms or change it so they have the same unit of joules and kilojoules. All right, any questions? I just kind of go back and try these problems. Um, so you still are going to have a study set due on Thursday next week. Um, yeah, and you should make a big note highlight in case you haven't noticed, and most of you have started noticing, in our notes, we do the problems that we're going to be doing in lab just have different numbers. So in lab, uh, there were two parts to this lab and I did not videotape it. This is next week's lab. This is lab eight. So this is week eight. Uh, because I am not allowed on campus for seven days. And so they actually kicked me off uh, the one day I was just walking around by the in the parking lot by the gym and they very rudely came and said, you can't be here. Okay. Um, so all that happens in this lab is you take a piece of metal. So I'll memorate the information over here. So we take uh, an unknown metal. So you all get a mystery metal. And so the metal has a mass of 55, of 55 grams. And we heat it to, so the temperature initial Notice I don't have a triangle that time. This is an actual temperature is 99.8 degrees Celsius. And then we're going to add it to water. So you get styrofoam coffee cups and you put water in there and you find the mass of the water. And the water is 225 grams and the water is at 21.0 degrees Celsius. So it's a really exciting lab to videotape. It's like the density lab. You see me getting masses and you see me measuring a temperature. Um, and so it's just going to have a data table. Uh, and then what happens, the two of them, you have a hot metal, you put it into cold water, you're going to come to an in-between temperature. And 
So you do. They come to a thermal equilibrium. The temperature you end up with is 23.1 degrees Celsius. So this is the big question here. And that's, why didn't it end up like at 50 or 60 degrees? Why is it ending up like the water barely changed temperature? We're going to do the math, but I'm just wondering if anybody kind of followed anything I've said so far. Because the water holds more heat. It's exactly right. Yes, that's the key. So, so usually a student says it's because you have more water. You, you, have, you do have more water. But the big difference, the bigger difference, it's, it's actually both pieces, is what Major just said. It's that specific heat of water. So we'll write it up here. The C of the water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. We'll do it as Celsius. Um, what we're trying to find is the C of the metal. We don't know what it is. Um, and so we're going to use this formula up here. That Q equals that. There is another piece to it. Um, this is the disadvantage of having to put this in this week. Um, so there is that the Q, oh, look, I made a little Q. Q of the water is equal but opposite to the Q of the metal. So the water is going to absorb heat and the metal is going to give off heat. This is thermal equilibrium, that they have to get to a point where the heat exchange between them, Q, is the same. So one of them is going to gain heat and one of them is losing heat. So the hotter one, metal, is giving heat to the water. Uh, and that's what that statement is saying. There is another way to say it, and I can show you. Um, I'll write it down here. I, when I learned it, I don't know if it was my physics or chemistry teacher, I learned it this way. And this is how I always do it, is I set the pieces, the two things that you're always mixing together, equal but opposite. Um, and we'll talk about the signs on the next page. There is another way of doing it. And in the lab, in the first page of the lab, it talks about this, that you can also do, it's a conservation of energy, that the Q of water plus the Q of the metal must equal zero. So the law of conservation of energy is that the Q of everything, when you add them up, has to come to zero. And that's how probably the book in Khan Academy and maybe Dave Faust teaches it this way. Um, I always, I just rearrange this and said it that they're equal but opposite. It really doesn't matter which side you put the negative sign on. Um, I mean, it does, but it really doesn't matter once we do the math. So what that means is actually there's a better way to write this formula that we're going to write it like this, that the mass of the water times the change in temperature of the water times the heat, the specific heat capacity of the water. Notice everything is clearly labeled because we have different masses, different heats is going to be equal but opposite. That negative sign is crucial, unless you're gonna write it out like this all on one side um, and then rearrange it anyway, is equal to the heat of the metal, sorry, the mass of the metal, the change in temperature of the metal, and the C of the metal. So you don't want to, when you're mixing two things, just label it as mass. Um, it's like when some of you write descriptions, you say it changed. I'm like, what's it? You all had your like uh, high school English teacher tell you you can't use that word. You have to explain what you're talking about. So you have to label when you state the formula. Um, I usually state this when I'm teaching because it helps students, but you don't have to state that. You do need to say the whole thing. Now, we're going to plug in and solve. So what are we solving for? We are solving for the specific heat of the unknown metal. So this is our unknown piece. So you can plug in first and solve. 
or you can rearrange and then solve. Um, the change in temperature, the key is the final temperature. So TF is T final. It is the same for both of them because you mix them together. They came to thermal equilibrium. The final temperature is the same. So for the water, your change in temperature is only going to be the difference between those. It's always final minus initial. So your change in temperature is T final minus T initial. So I'm going to pause this for like a moment. Give you guys a chance to try plugging in, see what you can do. Um, all right. So uh, the mass of the water is our 225. The change in temperature of the water is going to be the 23 minus the 21. Some people will write that in there. Or you can figure we got 2.1 degrees Celsius. Now, the sea of water, like Avogadro's number, where most of us now just write NA instead of writing the whole thing out, I'm going to write it out here because it's our first time using it. But you can absolutely just write CH2O and just know to punch it in your calculator. It's 4.184. And by next week, you're all going to be doing that. Um, joules per gram degree Celsius. So those are the numbers for the water. That equals negative. So the mass of our metal is 55. How the negative, we're going to get rid of it because you cannot have a negative mass. Also, you cannot have a negative specific heat. Um, it can't hold on to a negative amount of heat. You can have a negative change in temperature. And since it's final minus initial, so I have to do my math. This is seven, what we have 76. It's negative 76.7 degrees Celsius. Um, so that's how the negatives cancel out. Or if you do it this way, you'll see it's just it's just the algebra. Um, and then our unknown, which is C of the metal. And that's what we're solving for. So you would rearrange dividing by the 55.0 grams and I'll put it here so you can see it. We had a negative and a negative 76.7 degrees Celsius. So the negatives cancel out. I just change them right away. And when we put this in our calculator, the temperature unit cancels, our mass unit cancels. So our final unit is going to be this joules. I wrote, I, it's, you can write as joules per gram K or joules per gram degree Celsius. But um, my question is all the data that was collected in the fictitious lab question, all the data has three sig figs. Why does my answer have only two? My answer correctly has only two sig figs. There is a subtraction step. When you subtract, you are limited by place value. When you do the subtraction for the temperature change, and it's always the temperature change of the water, the temperature change of the water is always going to be small and will often be only two digits like it is here. The 2.1 is what limits me then to two sig figs. Um, yeah. So this ends up being a really cheesy lab because the temperature change is always so small. And we're using styrofoam coffee cups. Even Black Rock has better coffee cups than we have. We actually let you use two. You actually nestle them together, but styrofoam is not the best thing. Um, it works good enough, though, but a lot of heat is lost to the surroundings. We'll talk about that on the next page. The second piece here is, um, and so when you do this, 
study set for Thursday, which we'll go over, the first page of the study set is just using this formula. Um, either just plugging in like we did here or where you have two pieces and you mix them together. Um, the law of Dulong and Petit is these two dudes figured out um, there was a relationship with the periodic table and heat capacities. And as you go down on the periodic table, you um, decrease the specific heat. Um, and so things at the top of the periodic table, this is very interesting because usually they have the low, as you go down, things get bigger, like the size of the atoms get bigger, they become more dense. Um, but in this case, it actually becomes smaller. Their heat capacities, like gold's heat capacity is much smaller than copper's. So like within the family, copper wins this time and gold loses. Um, and so they found this relationship that the number 25 uh, divided by the heat capacity of the metal will give you very roughly, uh, they just did enough that they found it's the number 25, the molar mass. It is an estimate. This means in grams per mole. It is an extremely rough estimate. But it usually gets us close enough. So we're going to go ahead and try it with this one and see how we did. So we'll take the number 25 and we divide by our 0 0.47 joules per gram degree Celsius. The number 20, that number 25, the units would be really funky. So nobody ever puts units on it. And I don't remember what my answer comes out as. Oh, there we go. 53. So we get 53 grams per mole. And then we find our periodic table. And there's no 53. We're looking at the numbers underneath, but well, we're somewhere in here. So chromium, it's looking like it's chromium. It's the closest it is because this is a really rough estimate. So maybe it's chromium. So if you did it in lab, you would say, yeah, it looks like that's what it could be. Um, it has to be a metal, so you don't have a reaction. This is, this is actually my favorite. If somebody gets like uh, 23 as the mass, and they say, I had sodium. Um, so Damon did his paper on sodium, and so some of you were there at his presentation. If you had a piece of sodium, metal and you put it into water the temperature actually is going to change much more because you're not working with heat capacity anymore you're actually going to have a chemical reaction so no chemical reaction has happened here all right we're going to do one more step here and this is the logic piece to it because there is going to be logic with a lot of these that you have a piece of aluminum and you have a piece of iron and they're equal masses, and we put them in the oven so they get to 200 degrees Celsius. So my question is, which one absorbs more heat and why? So if we're going to this formula, right? So Q equals mass, change in temperature, and then heat capacity. So their mass, sorry. Their mass is the same, so we can ignore that. Their change in temperature is the same. So basically the heat, whichever one absorbs more heat is gonna be whichever one has the higher heat capacity. So the higher the heat capacity, the higher the heat. If these other two variables are the same, that's a big if. So based on what I just told you, which one is it? Look at your period, you guys have a periodic table somewhere handy. Hopefully. Like yeah, so it's going to be the aluminum. Um, you you could actually, usually I give you the numbers for it, but it's the smaller molar mass tends to have the higher heat capacities. I'm sorry, specific heat capacities. Um, and so in this case, 
the higher the heat capacity, the more heat at the mass and the change in temperature are the same. So it would be the aluminum. Um, if I ask a question like that ever, you don't have to write a perfect grammatically correct sentence. Arrows and symbols work great. Any questions from this page? Um, it all comes down to this formula. Uh, and then this idea that when you mix two things, one gains heat and one loses heat. And so they go until they hit a point of thermal equilibrium. And that's the final temperature is the same for both. All right. Um, and again, the study set for next Thursday gives you practice. The worksheet, the lab that will be next weekend is just a bunch of numbers to crunch. And you'll all be become really great at it. So now we're going to talk about enthalpy for the second half of this. And enthalpy is where we get into the chemist, more of the chemistry. Um, and I asked, what's the different, the, the symbol for enthalpy, enthalpy, I'm pretty sure is a Greek word, uh, is delta H. It's not read as triangle H again, it's delta H. And you can think of the H as standing for heat. However, you can think of it that way, and it is the change, right? Because that's what the the triangle means. You can never actually know the enthalpy. You can only know the change. So thinking of it as a change in heat, when I teach this my 100 level, and as we're going through it, I'm fine with you thinking of it there. Um, you can do a quick Google search of what the difference is. And again, we had this definition on the first page that heat is the flow of energy um, between two things until we hit this point of thermal equilibrium. The kinetic energy, that is the temperature. So heat and temperature are not the same thing. Temperature, of course, we measure in degrees Celsius, whereas heat we're measuring in joules and kilojoules. Um, and then they give you this definition. The easier way to think about it is enthalpy is it's it's similar, but it's the heat content. It's how much heat with specific conditions. What it means is you're gonna be we're gonna be doing it in chemistry per mole. Instead of heat would just be kilojoules, whereas enthalpy is kilojoules per mole, based on how much it's chemistry, how much reacted. In physics, you tend to use per gram. Um, because they're not using the periodic table, we're going to use per mole. So heat is going to be kilojoules, whereas enthalpy is kilojoules per mole. And again, I didn't, when I did the notes, I, I can never write this out elegantly. And so I typed it out on mine. You don't have to have that written down. You can do a Google thing and it comes right up and tells you just Google what's the difference between heat and enthalpy and we'll give it to you. I'm never going to ask you that question. Um, the physics book actually has this beautiful explanation. And every time I read it, I'm like, that's so beautiful. And then by the time I get to class, um, I'm always tongue tied. Uh, again, if you just think about it as the unit, that's the key that when we solve for enthalpy, it's kilojoules per mole. Oh, we're going to be able to do some factor label because we're going to have a balanced equation at the bottom of the page. Um, and so, but there is one more piece and it is highlighted here. It's big, bold, because this is one of the key things. So for the first page, it's that equation, Q equals mass times change in temperature times specific heat. For those of you who've taken physics, you know that formula. And so these problems won't be that bad. And those of you who haven't taken physics, when you take physics, it ends up being like those two weeks, you're like, we've done this. We did this in chemistry. Um, they just look at it from a slightly different angle because they're going to be looking at how much work can happen. Exothermic means exiting and therm means heat. So it is heat loss uh, in a chemical equation um, or heat that exits or heat that is released. Think of it like your bank account. When you lose money, it's negative. And so exothermic, 
exiting is always a negative delta H. So when we work with enthalpy, there is a number, there are units, and there is a sign. Uh, without the units and the sign, it's really meaningless. And I can't emphasize this enough. There's a poem that I wrote 10 years ago. Um, and so last year, they did not get the poem emailed to them after a week because uh, they were very good at showing their units and the sign. But there's always um, some students, if you don't show the units, it's meaningless. So with that, if this is heat loss, endo means into. And so this is heat gained or heat absorbed. We usually use the word release and absorbed in chemistry. And again, it's chemistry, so we look at it as far as a chemical reaction. And so your bank account or your stocks, whatever it is that you do, your Bitcoin, if it gains, you get a positive. So it, we'd say a positive delta H. So there's three ways you can determine. One way is in lab uh, using what's called calorimetry. And so the previous page, no chemical reaction happened, but you mix two things. We're going to do it on the next page and we're going to do a balanced equation. So you're going to do a chemical reaction and measure the temperature change. And so in calorimetry, you're measuring temperature change. And then you crunch some numbers and you can figure out the delta H for the reaction. So in terms of chemistry, this is going to be for a chemical reaction. Um, again, we're looking at it from a chemistry point of view. Of course, you can expand beyond this. And in physics, you'll look at this from a different perspective. Um, so that's one way. And that's the numbers we're going to crunch today um, in the first homework set. So you see the idea um, of how to be able to do the lab because there might be one student, there has yet to be one student who actually will do the lab before like a week from Sunday. The lab for this week, um, well, I don't know when people are going to watch this, but for those of you who are here, the lab this weekend is where you get to dye eggs. Don't use carrots. I'm telling you right now, my other class did this last week. Don't do carrots. No one got carrots to work. Everybody must have carrots in their house. Um, don't do carrots. So the best ones I've seen are the red cabbage. And they said they left them overnight and they're just coming out gorgeous. And then they actually, several people did something I have never thought of doing. They had acrylic paint. I apparently have a lot of artists. And they actually, after they dyed it, they painted um, like a really cool design on it. So that's another option I never thought about because I don't, I'm not a very good painter. Um, but people are sending me some, they, they just said they had a lot of fun. But don't, um, don't do carrots. The other one somebody tried was a banana. Um, and he got no color. And I'm like, well, bananas, like, what's the color of a banana? I'm like, what color did you think you were going to get? Um, I, I just thought it was really funny. He's been with me for two terms. He's like, yeah, that was. Um, and the other thing he tried was he tried hot pepper flakes, like, you know, what you put on pizza. Um, and it didn't work. But if you do the actual, like, where it's ground up, um, the chili powder, it comes out really cool. So apparently the spices have to be, things have to be ground up really well, but nobody could grind the carrots enough to get the beta carotene out of it. All right, so that's one way. The second way uh, is going to be something called Hess's Law. And we're going to hopefully do that tonight at the very end. We're going to do one problem. Uh, and then next week, we're going to do a lot with Hess's Law. But I wanted to show you one tonight so you kind of see what it looks like. Uh, and the third way is you look at the big chart of there's this big chart and we're going to work with this next week. There's a big chart and it's, you don't need to print it. Um, it's, it's in next week's folder that you can't get to yet, but there's where this should have been uh, a chart where somebody has figured out all these numbers for you in the lab, which is wonderful. Um, the thing about the chart is it has Delta H, which is enthalpy. It has S, does anybody know what S stands for? This is Chem 223. This is the summer. We get to use the whole chart. 
this is entropy. This is how much disorder, how much chaos is in. The thing that's really interesting, if you notice the delta H's, some are negative and some are positive. A lot of them are negative. This whole page is negative. You'll have negatives and positives. Yeah, look, there's some positives. But if you look at this column, everything's positive. That's the measurement of disorder. Disorder is positive because that is the only law of the universe that is true, which probably isn't, but that the disorder of the universe is increasing. That's why our universe is expanding. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of ways you can interpret that. So all the other laws are actually sub laws of that one. And then delta G, which is free energy. And so we put the whole chart together. We're going to only use this first column. Um, and we're going to use that next week in the second half of the notes when we finish the notes. These notes used to be 10 pages, um, but the snow has confounded us and also having less time for the class. All right, so there's the big chart, which means somebody else did all the work. Um, there's a lot of words here. Those words are in yours. Uh, and those are wonderful. So remember I said if you're having trouble falling asleep, you can go and read. 20 pages. This is 20 pages condensed down. And then me condensing it down into my, I have a really simple mind. Um, it is a state function, enthalpy. It doesn't matter how you got there. It just matters that you're there. It just matters where you are now. Um, right. And all this stuff. Um, as we use it, We'll work with it. it. This comes in when we do Hess's Law and some of the things. Um, and we'll worry about all those words. You can ignore them. But I'm required to tell you. This is this is actually a piece that I kind of mentioned before. So temperature, extensive versus intensive. So temperature is actually what's called an intensive property. If you take physics, they always spend a lot of time talking about extensive and intensive. Um, so if you have a spoon of hot water versus a pot of hot water, they're at the same temperature, but they'll definitely have a different amount of heat because there's a different mass of the water, a spoon of water versus like a whole bathtub or a whole bat. Um, anyway, uh, and then this down here, temperature and heat are not the same thing. Really simple. Temperature is the kinetic energy, the giggles, the jiggles. So how much the higher as you increase the jiggles, you're increasing the temperature. Heat is the flow, right? That's our thing. Um, until we reach the same kinetic energy. So until the temperature is hit in equilibrium. Um, and so more importantly for us is this. Most students... Yeah, you can also Google the difference between temperature and heat. Um, the units are also the key. Temperature is degrees Celsius. Heat is going to be joules. So very different units. Um, the system versus the surroundings is actually really important because on the previous page where we had the water versus the metal, um, so the, the metal we'd think of as the system or the substance, and the surroundings were the water. In terms of chemistry, just looking at from chemistry, the system is going to be the chemical reaction. And the surroundings is everything else. So that could include the test tube, um, you and me, et cetera, et cetera, the test tube, et cetera. Um, so if we were doing this in a lab where you mix two things in a test tube, that test tube is the surroundings. What that has to do with the top of the page is if the reaction is exothermic negative, it's giving off heat. You're the surroundings. You're going to absorb the heat it's getting off. So remember, everything's equal but opposite. They have to come to the thermal equilibrium. So if the test tube feels hot, it's because the reaction is giving off heat to the test tube. So the reaction is exothermic. If the test tube, so this would be like a hot pack. Um, right now, right, they probably sold out of those in the store. Endothermic, your hand 
is the surrounding. So it could be your hand. Just put that or your feet, if you put the hot pad on your feet. Um, right. And so it's absorbing heat. So it's going to absorb the heat from your hand. Your hand's going to get colder. Your hand is losing kinetic energy to this system because it's absorbing it from you. And so that would be the idea behind a cold pack is it's actually a chemical reaction is happening in there um, that's pulling heat from you. All right. We're going to do, do one factory label today, and that's this. If we have a balanced equation, why not? Um, so let's just do it. So there's our equation. And it wants to know how many kilojoules. So that's what we're solving for is kJ. So this is a pet peeve of probably every physics and chemistry teacher. The k is kilo. It is a lowercase k. Joules is a capital J. So please don't make the J a little J with a dot. That's really cute. You can do that with your own name. I can do that with my name, but at Joules, we write it as a capital J. I think there was probably somebody famous with that name who came up yeah, with the idea. All right, we're going to do 10 grams of nitrogen. And it is a balanced equation. It's good practice. Uh, nitrogen diatomic. And I do actually usually do this lecture um, before this midterm, this the celebration too, um, because there's a lot of information in thermodynamics. All right, uh, our first step is it's chemistry, so we go to moles. And again, I usually see people do really well with this because that's all it is. So this is. N2 is going to be 28-ish grams per mole. And then, this is the thing that's really sweet. We use the balanced equation. So, delta H is always written after a balanced equation. And it just says, so this is an endothermic equation. And I know that if there's no sign, it means it's positive. So unlike when we did oxidation reduction where you had to show me the positive and negative, with this, if it's a negative, you show me, but if it's a positive, you just leave it. So endo, heat is going into it. This is part of the equation, meaning for every two moles of N2, this is part of the stoichiometry. Remember that awesome word from like a month ago? we are going to get 163.2 kilojoules of heat absorbed. And, oops, didn't use the racing one. Uh, we punch it in and you'll get my answer. So that's it. And that's why we've been doing factor labels. When we get to this, it's like, oh, that's pretty straightforward. So you could go from anything in the equation to the delta H. Delta H goes with this equation. This goes back up to this, the state dependent. It does depend on what state of matter we have. It does depend on how our equation is balanced. So remember how I kept saying we're using lowest whole number coefficients? We're going to go with that. There is a point next week where I change and we start using fractions. That gives us a different answer. Um, and so the balanced equation is really important that we all are doing it the same way. Um, all right, let's go on to the last page, kind of put it all together a little bit. And then we do more with next week. And it just takes being immersed in it. So, again, the first way to figure out delta H enthalpy change is calorimetry. That is the fancy calorimeter that you're not getting to use with this lab. This is in all honesty, like a really cheesy lab. I think the snowstorm is because I kept going, oh, really? I'm going to have to go in and film myself putting putting stuff in and like just finding a temperature. Um, and then I was banned from campus for a week like everybody. Um, all right. So there are fancier ones. We'll see them next week. Um, and so they just made your temperature. You take the lid off. You dump what it is in there. So there is one other piece. And we're not going to worry about this statement today. Um, 
But calorimetry, as it says, is our experimental way to determine delta H. Um, so again, measuring heat flow. Uh, and we're going to do it with a chemical reaction. And we're going to be, we're not going to worry about these statements today. We'll worry about them next week. And the reason is in lab, we always ignore that because it's styrofoam and it's not a perfect system. Um, my first two years, I did not ignore this and students got negative answers because um, so much heat is lost by the styrofoam to the surroundings. And so we didn't have a good closed system. So we're going to take some magnesium chips and we're going to put them not into water. Is that because kind of quite a reaction? We're going to dump them into some HCl. Now, this is the other thing with the surroundings. That molarity means we have a solution. Um, so it's HCl and water. So the solution is the surroundings, meaning the water. When you make up a solution, you're like 99.999% water and only a little bit of it is the HCl. That's really what's going on. When we say how many moles, if we went down and figured out based on the how much is in there, it's a really small amount that's the HCl. But in the chemical reaction, it is going to be the magnesium chips, which means solid, is going to react with the HCl, which is aqueous. So the solution is the surroundings. The HCl that was in the solution is going to react with the magnesium. That is the system. So this is the system that we are calculating the delta H for. We're going to measure the temperature change of the solution and make it do the whole thing. That's where this sign is. You guys go ahead and write your equation. You can even do oxidation reduction if you want. Oh, in a good shape. Look at this law in here. Whew. All right, what type of reaction is it? It's a single. It is a single. We have an element plus HCl. So the magnesium goes with the chloride. MgCl2, because magnesium ends up with a plus two. Again, if you see this before, well, we put the halo over the magnesium by itself. The Cl is an ion. It's it's not in its diatomic form. That would kill us in lab. Uh, and we get hydrogen gas. We Actually, that was the only fun part of this lab. We always tried to blow up the hydrogen gas. It never worked. It's really such a small amount um, that we tried every possible way, not to blow it up, but to light it on fire. It, really was disappointing. I had a class one year and they were, this one guy was determined. Uh, and so balancing it, we have two hydrogens and two chlorines, so we'll have a two there. So notice states of matter the whole way across. The magnesium is a solid, HCl is aqueous. Back to the question several of you asked during office hours. This is a single, so we can have aqueous. We're going to do, if you notice down here, like we have combustions, Combustions, combos, decomps, never, ever, no aqueous. They can't. They wouldn't combust if there was aqueous. How come the MgCl2 is aqueous if the Mg is a earth metal? Oh, if you look at that chart that you asked me about, Major. Remember that chart? You guys, when you take your, yeah, the celebration, that chart. So chlorides are actually very soluble. The only ones they're not with is silver, um, lead, and mercury. So uh, fluorides are not. It's kind of a funky thing, but chlorides, bromides, iodides. Uh, and so this one is aqueous. That is why when you take your celebration, I'll be here on Zoom. So if you have a moment and you're, you're just like, ah, you can just come on Zoom because often just talking it through with somebody um, and I'll help guide you with your chart to read it so you can have your aha moment. All right, that is the system again. We don't actually need this equation to do the problem, 
but it does help to see this is what we're going to try to find the delta H. Uh, we call it the delta H R, or I write R X N, which means the delta H of the reaction. That's what we're trying to calculate here. All right, so I'm I did break it up into two steps. Um, I I don't I guess I did that. All right, uh, and again you can do it one of two ways. You can say, like I said, the Q of the HCl. Um, another way of saying this is the Q of the HCl or the Q of the solution. So I just say sol or a solution. Because that's the surroundings is equal but opposite to the Q of the reaction. So the reaction is the system. And the solution is the surroundings. Um, we are measuring the temperature of the solution. So I think just for simplicity, I'd written the HCl there, which is fine, but technically it's the surroundings. It's the solution, which is mostly the water. Technically the surroundings is also a calorimeter, but we're ignoring that right now. Um, all right, so the Q of the solution is what we're calculating. And that is mass change in temperature times C of the solution. Uh, in this problem, I make a comment that I assume that my C is the C uh, same as W, which means water. Um, if it is not the same as water, so like sometimes it's a problem where it's like ethanol, it will actually give you what the C of the solution is. Um, all right. So we want the mass. Again, this is our solution, 100 grams. Delta T again is the change in temperature. I wore my dragon again because I figured we're studying heat. So I was like, what do I have? Like a dragon, that would get things hot. Um, so the change in temperature. So reading, uh, we started at 22 degrees, 22.2, and we ended up at 44.8. So you can figure it out or you can always uh, write it in that we have 44 the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So some students like to write it in and some students just figure it out. So again, it is always the final temperature minus the initial. Um, when you see delta, it's always final minus initial. And we'll talk about that more again next week. Uh, and then the C of the solution, we're assuming it's the same as water. So um, unless you're told otherwise, so that's the 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. All right. I think in the lab, I give you a different number. And some of the homework problems, or it might be on the worksheet, there's one where you put it into ethanol. All right, we punch this in and we get a number. Ooh, you get a large number, um, and that's because chemical reactions give off a lot of heat or absorb a lot of heat. So I usually go to kilojoules, but we can keep it in joules for right now. I usually always change the kilojoules. Um, we can do it in the next step. So when you punch this in, you'll get 9456 nine, joules. Our grams and our Celsius cancel. So again, that's the Q of the solution. That's our step one. I'll say that was our step one. All right, let's go to step two. So for step two, we're going to do the delta H of the reaction, which is the Q of the reaction over how much reacted. So again, 
um, enthalpy is always the easiest way to explain it's always per something per the mass or in chemistry per uh, we're going to do the moles of the magnesium so the q of the reaction we stated up here it's equal but opposite to the q of the solution so we're going to have negative q of our solution and you can do it as second as a separate step or i'll just write it's negative q of my solution and we're going to go over the moles of the magnesium. Um, so we have negative nine, four, five, six joules. So again, the reaction makes sense. The temperature increased of the solution. It went from 22. Once we added the magnesium, it got really hot. It went up to 44. So the reaction of the magnesium with the HCl must have been giving off heat that the solution was absorbing, and that's why the solution got hotter. Um, and so it makes sense that the reaction is negative because it's exothermic. Um, to do moles of magnesium, we know that we had a certain mass of magnesium that was given at the beginning of the problem, so the 0 0.500 grams of our magnesium and we change its moles. So that's the periodic table, 94.3 grams to one mole. Um, I'm gonna do one more step. I'm gonna, I ran out of room. Uh, I change it always to, joule, to kilojoules. So a thousand joules to one kilojoule. However you like to, when we're working with delta H's with chemistry, um, and so you would punch that in And what did I get? Oh, I have a different number. I knew that was going to happen. We're going to go with this. So my number up here is slightly different because I knew that I changed this question. Uh, so I get like negative 460 kilojoules per mole. You can say per mole of magnesium or just. So up here, we would then write negative 460 kilojoules per mole. All right. Um, questions. My answer there is different because I used, I, I know I this assumption I didn't do. I use the number from lab. All right. Any questions before we embark on Hess's law? And again, the questions will probably come up next Thursday. Um, so Hess's law. I wanted to introduce it because um, once you get Hess's law, it ends up being one of those sweet points, like the limiting reactant problems. You guys are all getting those. Um, the mixtures are never anybody's favorite. The the empirical formula from combustion, once you get them, it's like, oh, got it. Um, except there's a lot of numbers to crunch. Hess's law is the same way. Initially, it's like, what is she doing? It's so different. Um, but once you see how to do it and what it is, is it's calculating delta H from a number of different reactions. So we do a couple different reactions and you can add reactions together. It's just algebra. Um, so there's a couple key things we need with this. And that's what those three steps talk about. Uh, and so the first thing is if you reverse the reaction, the delta H, the, the sign changes. So what that means is if it's positive in one direction, if you go the other direction, it's negative. Um, it's a lie that I've been telling you that reactions go, we always go forward. Reactions can go different ways. Um, to keep it simple for our second celebrations, our reactions always go one direction. And then eventually we go in other directions. All right, if you double reaction, you, you just double the delta H. Um, 
And and again, for A, what it means is if the forward is positive, then when you go in the other direction, it's negative. And we'll see that when we do one of these down here. Uh, and if you add the two reactions together, you add the delta H's. So whatever you do to the reaction, you do the same thing to the delta H. Um, the delta H is part of the reaction. That's really our key here. All right, so we're going to do this first example. Um, and this one is just simply adding these two equations together. So it's just choice C. And when you add these equations together, this is like our equal sign, right? The arrow. If there is something that is on the reactant side in one equation on the product side of the other, when we add it together, you guys can see that the H2O gas is going to cancel. There's, there's two on the reactant side and on the next one, state of matter does matter. So we bring down the equations, the two together, we have CH4 gas, two oxygen gas, and we get CO2 gas plus two H2O liquid. So adding these two equations together, basically. Uh, and then you just add the delta H's. And we get negative 890 kilojoules. We just write it just like that at the end of the equation. Um, and so that's how things cancel out. If something is a product and a reactant in different reactions, they can cross out. And so it's actually a really cool thing. Um, it's, it's because chemistry is algebra taken to the next level. All right. Um, sorry, I, I can't believe I, I um, there's cans of worms that happen in thermodynamics and a couple of them happened in these notes that I didn't realize tonight, but we'll go ahead and go with it and, and we'll look at this more in the next uh, next Thursday. So enthalpy of formation. This is enthalpy of a reaction. It makes total sense. A chemical reaction happens, it either absorbs or releases heat. I have no idea who came up with this term, enthalpy of formation. Um, but basically it is forming one mole of a compound. It's where we're going to get these fractions. We're going to make one mole of the compound from its elements. We will write it as a chemical reaction. It's a combination reaction. It doesn't make sense because I don't think this really happens. This is not how compounds are made. Compounds are made by other reactions like the double displacements, the single replacement. Somebody wants something from somebody else. There's actually a, one more piece to this. It's el elements in their standard state. So oxygen is O2 as a gas. Uh, nitrogen is N2 as a gas. Iron is just Fe solid. Bromine is Br2 and it's a liquid. That's why it's blue here on my periodic table. So diatomics or diatomics. Uh, carbon is the one. Oh good, that's here. So let's just go ahead and do it. Uh, so we'd have carbon plus oxygen and we make CO. Now let's put our states of matter in. The CO is the gas, uh, oxygen is the gas, and carbon. We're going to change it to just carbon solid in a minute, but I get to teach you something because that's like being a teacher. Uh, carbon has something called allotropes, and allotropes are different forms of an element. Oxygen has allotropes. Um, oxygen's Standard state is O2, but there are other forms of oxygen. For example, um, ozone, so O3, right? What's in our atmosphere? So carbon is an interesting one, and there is carbon as graphite, there's carbon as diamond, there's carbon as gas, there is now carbon as buckyball, there is carbon as graphene. 
Carbon is graphite is considered the standard state. I don't know why. I don't know enough about these. I just get to teach you that part. So you, if it is carbon in an enthalpy of formation, you technically write carbon as graphite. So carbon, that's as graphite, plus O2 gas. Now we have to balance it. This is where we use fractions. You always make one mole of the compound. I don't know why. I didn't make up this definition. It's the most bizarre definition. It's only used to teach this one thing, and we're going to do it, which means for this to balance, you have to use a fraction. Um, so if you did it as two, one, two, it is actually not the enthalpy of formation. All right. This is the equation we are going to try to get to using Hess's law with these other two equations. So, um, again, this is the last thing I'm going to do. And I just want to show you it. And what we're going to start with next Thursday is we will do more with Hess's law, but the hope is, is that you'll at least say, okay, I just add the equations together. If I do this, I, yeah. Um, and it just takes a little bit of practice and you'll get it. So, and sometimes there's three, sometimes there's four equations. Um, you look for the piece that is unique to that equation. So like the carbon graphite, carbon solid, the only place it shows up is right here. It doesn't show up anywhere else. Um, we need to have only one because there's only one here in the equation we're trying to get to. And we need it on the reactant side. And it is. So this is OK. Our first equation is good to go. We're not going to touch it. I like to circle the piece that I want so I know, all right, I've got it. You can't abbreviate carb graphite as G because that would mean gas. So you actually have to write the whole word out. On the second equation, the piece that I need is the carbon monoxide. But we have a couple problems here. I ignore the oxygen because the oxygen's all over the place. And so I'm going to hope it's going to work out when I do this. I need the carbon monoxide to be a product. So I have to flip this equation. So when I flip it, I have two CO2s going to two COs plus the O2. So that's what this up here, when we flip the equation, we change the sign. So this becomes a positive 566. So for the one way it was negative, now when I flip it and write it from the other perspective, it becomes the opposite sign. We still have one more problem. So you may see the last issue we have with this equation. There's two moles. Yeah, the coefficient. So I only want one mole of the CO. So this equation down here, the one that we flipped, we're going to have to divide everything by one half. The whole equation, including the delta H. So I'm going to divide by two. That, that two is going to cancel. This two just cancels. And my oxygen becomes a one half. And this delta H, I'm going to divide by two. So for my second equation here, I flipped it over. I flipped the equation around and reversed it. And I divide by two. I'm sorry, I divide by two. I wrote it as divide by one half, but it's we're dividing by two. Um, all right. Now, before we go on and add them together, we're almost done, is we want, so I'm going to cross out this equation. Let's do it in blue. Because this is how I rewrote it. And now I want to make sure I have all the pieces that I need. So I have my carbon. I have my carbon up here. I have my one CO. 
I don't want CO2. And hooray, look at that. Alleluia. The CO2 is a product, it's a reactant, crosses out. So if it's on opposite sides of the equation and different equations, the two was gone because I divided by two and the oxygen. So in this equation, I only want half an oxygen on the reactant side. Well, this half oxygen is going to cancel. So this is going to become a one half when I get up there. It's not a one half in this equation. It's just I'm trying to show that this one half is going to, this one half in this hole is going to make it a one half there. So we're good. I guess I shouldn't cross that out. Huh? I can't fix that. Now we just add these together, the negative 393.5, and we add the 566, dividing that by two. And you should get this number. And that means it's exothermic because it's negative. Love missing a whole week of school in the seventh week. Um, questions? <laughs> 